Good morning and good evening. Welcome to the Moonshot International Symposium for Goal 1 and Goal 3. Thank you for joining us today. In today's session, session 3, we will welcome the program director and project managers of Moonshot Goal 1. They will explain about the goal and the research projects that will help achieve this goal. After their presentations, we will have a panel discussion along with our esteemed international guests. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in Zoom's Q&A box. We will pick up some questions during the panel discussion. Now, let me invite uh, Professor Hagata, Program Director of Moonshot Goal 1, to give us an overview of this goal. Professor Hagata, over to you. Yes, thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, please let me explain about the uh, program overview of this uh, project, uh, Moonshot Goal 1. OK. So the, let me explain about the overview of the program on the Moonshot Goal 1, the realization of the society in which human being uh, can be uh, free from the limitations of the body, brain, space, and time by 2050. I'm Nori Hagita from the Osaka University of Arts. And Moonshot, Adan the program says a very interesting word, a bold new program for creating disruptive innovations. And also that we will attack the challenges of facing the future society through ambitious goal-oriented research project, living beyond the limits of the conventional technology without fear of failure. It's a very, very ambitious uh, one uh, without the fear of failure. And Moonshot goals falls into seven goals. I just uh, contributed to the goal one. And JST also contributed to the four kind of goals. And goal two is a ultra early disease prediction and intervention. It's a very, very interesting project. And goal three, the AI robots. The today's symposium is collaborated with uh, goal three. And goal six is also very competitive on the universal quantum computers. Uh, these four kind of things is very, very interesting for us. So the why do we start Moonshot Goal 1 program? To overcome the challenge of uh, declining the birth rate, aging population, and associated labor shortage, the key is to realize a society free from the limitations of body, brain, space, and time, and allow the people with the various backgrounds and the values. This is a very important, uh, including the autism, um, ALS patient, or elderly, and those with responsibilities for nursing and child care to actively participate in society. Uh, we made a vision for a society in 2050. In this case, uh, I just coined the new word, cybernetic avatar. The cybernetic avatar technology will make a work and play more accessible for everyone. We also set the several scenes. The scene one says the disaster relief. Uh, more than a thousand uh, cybernetic avatars operated by the teleoperators will perform a large scale and complicated mission in the disaster sites. And professionals and the teleoperation will conduct rapid re rescue while ensuring that they are our safety. 
And Sun Tu, uh, very interesting, enjoy cybernetic, uh, cyber uh, physical sports uh, uh, together in that future. With the cybernetic avatars, you can enjoy sports together regardless of age or uh, where you live. For example, this team, one team comes from the two real athletes and one cybernetic avatar uh, coming from the different place uh, operator. And these kind of the teams will create the new kind of sports, the cyber, um, cyber physical sports will, will, be, will be created. The currently only the young guys play at the eSports, but the 2050, the cyber physical sports might be very exciting. I hope it. And scene three, I love uh, this uh, scene. The lady on the beach in Hawaii uh, have a full holidays. That means uh, even though the she is uh, on the beach, she has a chance to watch the sunrise in Mount Fuji. If the summit, the cybernetic avatar in the summit of the Mount Fuji. And also the, after that, uh, she has a chance to take a lesson from the pianist in the cyberspace. And in the afternoon, join the live performance of uh, uh, her favorite pop star. So the, your life will have a, a lot of uh, experience uh, uh, before, never before. And scene for health and uh, longevity uh, protected by avatar. And uh, in this case, uh, you have a farm and uh, avatar will control the, some uh, vegetable. And uh, scene five says uh, maximizing creativity and the multiple users can also remotely operate the multiple cybernetic avatars at the same time. And a new kind of artwork will be created in collaboration with the architect and many, many artists in the world. And so the cybernetic avatar has a special features, go anywhere. When operating the cybernetic avatars, users feel the same sensation as with their own bodies, therefore expanding the possible range of human activity. And so the moonshot goal one falls into two target. The target one says uh, a cybernetic avatar infrastructure for diversity and inclusion. For example, by 2030, we will develop the technologies and infrastructure that allow one person to operate more than 10 avatars for one task at the same speed and accuracy as one avatar. I already done the, the multiple remote operations for by one operator. The 2008, uh, we made a field experimentation in the Osaka. The one operator can remotely operate four robots at the same time. So each robot interact with uh, different uh, uh, people. And this control is very, very complicated for the tele operators and complicated to manage task with uh, human robot interaction. Uh, I just show you. So at that time that we just uh, developed a special task management control systems. Uh, in the network robot systems. But uh, this uh, cybernetic avatar just tried to uh, 
uh, built the special uh, teleoperation, multiple teleoperation, more than 10 cybernetic avatar. And the cybernetic avatar also has a functionality of the virtual reality with a 3D video avatar in cyber physical space. And the next one is very important. The augmenting a body cognition and perception for a fulfilling life. We will be free from the conventional limitations of our bodies and brains, especially the cognition and the perception, and have abundant means to achieve our dreams. And cyborg technology expands the functionality of our bodies and brains and will allow everyone to play active roles in their work and hobbies. So the uh, target two in Moonshot Goal 1 is focus on the cybernetic avatar life. Uh, so by 2030, we will develop the technology that will allow anyone willing to uh, argument or augment their physical, cognitive, and perceptual capabilities for specific tasks and propose a, a new lifestyle that will be welcomed by society. That means that welcome means a very important. Uh, many people uh, will be accepted to the new kind of the cybernetic avatar services. Uh, so that sometimes we have to think about the ethical and legal and social and economic uh, implication or the challenge we have to consider all the things. And also that we are assuming the three types of the target users in cybernetic avatars. The type one users, uh, tele women just remotely control the cybernetic avatar and the cybernetic avatar just take care of the elderly uh, child. And in this case, uh, we call the human avatar interaction with hospitality. And the type two users, the each users in advance where the wearable devices or the systems and using the, these devices and the systems, uh, we uh, the people will share the some experience. Uh, for example, the F1 race among the people, and the type three users, the who could not use the, any human interface of uh, type one users and the type two users. For example, a less patient, uh, it is difficult to use the uh, uh, interface in type one and type two users. So sometimes uh, they imagine in his brain and allow CA operation. Uh, the, so that we just focus on the brain machine interface. New types of the brain machine interface might be the very promising for them. So I just selected the three excellent project managers uh, for the user type one users. The Hiroshi Ishiguro from uh, Osaka University just tried to develop the human avatar interaction with hospitality. And Professor Kota Minamizawa from Keio University also contributed to the development of the shared experience with wearable devices and the systems. And Dr. Ryota Kanai from ATL uh, just tried to develop the AI-based uh, brain machine in CA systems. Uh, if you are interested in the, uh, their works, and after my talk, uh, he they will give us a talk the briefly. Uh, anyway, the Hiroshi Ishiguro just focused on featuring the hospitality rich dialogue. 
And the Minamizawa quota was just tried to choose the special systems for sharing the, their variety of skills and experiences with many other people. The country almost people focus on the Instagram or YouTube. But he will create or build the new types of the sharing system, especially to focus on the skills and experience in the world. And uh, Ryota Kanai also tried to develop the special brain machine interface. Uh, and he is an expert for the AI technology and machine learning. And he will create the ultimate BMI semantic avatars. And we are assuming the full layer the R&D management in the application layer, just focus on the collaboration of the uh, some overcoming limitations of space, time, and body and brain. And we will assuming the several field experimentations. Uh, the, in the 2025, uh, we assuming to exhibit the, our uh, research output in the Expo 2025 in Osaka. And middle rear layer is very important. The variety of the semantic avatar, different type of the semantic avatar with a different specification will be developed. After that, the standardization is very important. We just focus on the uh, special functions uh, uh, such as uh, interoperability and scalability might be very important. And uh, also information security is also very important. And the core technology, technology layer is just focus on the teleoperations. The first stage, we just focus on the multiple CA corporations. The finally, we just focus on the autonomous or 3D operations. And the last layer is very important, uh, the basic research and else issues. Else means the ethical, legal, social, and economic issues. We tried to challenge the, these things. And the uh, program director, the uh, message to the project uh, managers, uh, this development a human-centered R&D project on the cybernetic avatars and developed, developed from the viewpoint, not only the providers, but also the users in the future society. And sometimes the R&D project should also do basic research on the human stress caused by them and the stress relief method were taking into account ethical, legal, social, economic, health issues and information security. And our moonshot goal one will contribute to the mainly the following SDGs, quality education, gender equality, uh, workforce and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, uh, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and responsible consumption and productions. Let me summarize uh, my talk that these uh, project manager will create the new kind of the cyber after within five years. Uh, this is my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> now let's move on to the project overview presented by the project managers. The first project manager is Professor Ishiguro Hiroshi from Osaka University. Professor Ishiguro, over to you. So, okay. All right. So the, my title is the uh, realization of an avatar symbiotic society where everyone can perform active roles without constraint. 
So I'm uh, Hiroshi Shiguro and I'm professor of Osaka University and the visiting director of ATR uh, Hiroshi Shiguro Laboratories. And, uh, and of course, you know, I'm a Moonshot project manager. And uh, while well, I'm a thematic project producers for uh, World Exposure 2025. Okay. So um, our purpose is to develop uh, cybernetic avatars. So I want to go back to the uh, origin, origin of the avatars. Okay, so um, probably this is not the origin of avatars. And uh, if we investigate the uh, literatures in some other uh, the uh, robotics works, and uh, you know, uh, we may find the more old works. But uh, um, I think uh, this this is my work. I have proposed a teleported robot in uh, 1999s in, in the conference, uh, a robot a robot conference, IROS. Okay, I think uh, this is uh, one of the uh, uh, the well uh, pioneer work in robotics. So the, what I have proposed um, this, uh, this simplified teleoperated robots. This is a combination of uh, computers and and the mobile platform, right? So um, after this, um, the, around the uh, 2010 and 2011, so many companies, venture companies, um, they brought the similar uh, avatar, the teleoperated robots um, to this, you know, the uh, my my simplified robots. And, and uh, you know, the, I, I I don't remember the exact number of uh, companies, but uh, I could see the more than 20 companies in the world that developed the, uh, and the, this kind of uh, simplified robot and the soul. Uh, they, they were selling the, a lot of uh, the avatars, but uh, unfortunately we couldn't change the, uh, our, um, uh, our lifestyle with this, the uh, therapeutic robot. So people expect to have more uh, the uh well uh um how can I say that uh, uh the uh, remote work by using uh, this uh teleoperated robots and it, we have expected to change the our lifestyle but uh I, you know um the uh after the uh boom of uh, teleoperated robots you know, the, almost all company disappears. Just the uh, uh, one or two companies uh, survived, and and then you know the we uh, faced to the uh, uh, coronavirus situations, and in the coronavirus situations, we have recognized the importance of uh, our remote work uh, by using uh, this kind of a uh, teleoperated robot. Right. So, and so, anyways, uh, after proposing. Uh, after proposing that the uh, teleoperated robot, I have seriously um, the, uh, studied the uh, the uh, human-like robot and uh, human-like teleoperated robot. It's called the Geminoid, and and this the the uh, my focus. I think uh, you know, we 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 have uh, two types of uh, teleoperated robot. The one, the, the one is uh, one is to share the all sensations, and and, and to uh, the well, they carefully control the uh, all um, uh, um, um, well. The, how can I say that? Uh, you know, the, by sharing the all sensations. So, uh, and if we control the um, bodies, you know. Um, uh, movement, body movements, so and uh, uh, we can they quickly adapt to the avatars. So, um, but uh, so that is the one type. Another type is uh, you know is just focus on the conversations. So our case is uh, we were focusing on the uh, com uh, conversational avatars. So operator is just uh, watching the monitors, and uh, and uh, you know the talkings and the computers analyzing the voice and the. Uh, the uh, making the uh, lip movement and head movement and gestures also right so this is the very they are very easy uh, the operations therefore the, we could use uh, this the, the robot these avatars um and and in, in a very practical ways and actually i was running the uh, um, 
uh, conference talk and the uh, uh, research meetings by using this robot and uh, very human like uh, the avatars. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, but unfortunately, you know, the, this is my copy and my, co my, and my appearance was not good for the everybody. Therefore, you know, the, I have developed the uh, more um, better the avatar for everybody. And the idea was um, to make the minimal design of humans uh, uh, with which we cannot say the uh, genders and, and and age, right? So this is a quite neutral, right? There is no features, uh, the uh, personal, um, the uh, features, right? But uh, so the good things of this robot uh, is, in, is the robot can encourage the uh, interlocutor's imaginations. So as shown in this video, right? So especially for the elderly, so elderly, you know, they are not so good for talking with humans but uh, you know by using by using this teleoperated robot they could talk a lot right so um and now we have a companies um uh, which providing the conversational service by using this robot it's called a telenoid and the, the, com uh, the companies they providing the services in elderly care houses and and you know the uh, well the people I think uh, 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 well as el uh, elderly and they are, are accepting this you know robot very well. So and one more the uh, uh, e uh, example of a therapeutic robot is uh, is this small robot. But in, uh, with this small robot, what we are doing is uh, to you know two operators the uh, uh, um, collaborating and the operating the, this robot. So main, you know, in this case, um, the, we, uh, we have uh, nurse and the uh, medical doctors, right? So nurse knows the uh, uh, daily conditions of a patient and mainly the nurse is talking uh, through the robots. But uh, if a nurse you know, need to help, uh, when the rob uh, nurse need to help, uh, of uh, medical doctors, you know, nurse can ask the question to the medical doctors, right? So, nurse and the medical doctors collaborating the ending, you know, the um, treating the you know the patient, and the, so that means that this small robot could have uh, uh, the uh, the high performance, the very high abilities to treat the patient. Right? So this is the uh, integrations of. Uh, uh people uh the uh people's abilities the, through the uh, therapeutic robots so and and in addition to that um the we are developing the the technologies to make the avatars intelligent and, auto, and autonomous so if we use the two um two robots like this right so and actually, you know, the um, well, robot can continue the conversations with the, the interlocutors, uh, even if, uh, um, I mean, so the voice recognition function is not perfect, right? But, but however, you know, the um, and you know, the robot need to uh, they continue the conversation, um, especially. Uh, uh, well, they, with the elders, the, the uh, robot, and um, elders' voice sometimes it's very difficult to understand, to recognize. But but if we, uh, we use the two robots, the robot they, they can continue the conversations. But when the robot cannot understand the uh, elders' uh, utterance, the uh, robot uh, talks with uh, um, uh, talks with uh, with each other, right? And then you know the robots wait the response from the elders. So so by using the two robots, so we can have a very stable the uh, the conversational functions, autonomous conversational functions. Okay. And if we choose the situation and purpose, and and if we prepare the a lot of a top uh, possible topics for the conversations, you know that we can develop this kind of a free autonomous conversational the android so in this case we have uh, so 
the android sitting in the in the lobby of atr atr is a research institute um, in which i have uh, my project and the, the this uh, the android erica is uh, sitting in the lobby and talking with the visitors so the usually um, in the conversation with the visitors we do not have uh, deeper deep conversation right and therefore i think uh, you know it is not so difficult um to develop the uh, autonomous conversation android for that kind of purpose so but of course you know we have developed the, so many uh the functions for this android and they prepare the uh, more than 150 topics right? so and 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 for the conversations and uh, well and actually the uh, visitor uh, they can and they can have uh, well the uh, human like conversation with this android maybe the five minutes to the uh, 10 minutes okay so the uh, one more challenge um the is to develop this kind of a uh, um, childlike android so for the adult and problem of adult android um we need to focus on the particular purpose and the situ uh, and the situations and you know um, because it's quite difficult, uh, the people expect to have uh, adult level conversations for the adult Android, right? So that is not so easy. But uh, if we give uh, child appearance to the Android, so Android and, and the Android can ask any kind of questions to the people and gather the information, right? So, um, well, the, uh, the people, they can accept the uh, child Android easily. Right. So if we ex expect uh, to use the Android and in our societies, right, I think this is the uh, our, uh, the possible the uh, solutions. Right. So we are uh, uh, um, okay. So um, do we, I, I I think uh, you know that this is the, uh, the uh, one of the possible uh, the avatar. This robot is going to be one of the possible avatars. So anyway, by using uh, uh, these teleoperated technologies and the autonomous robot and Android technologies, so by 2050s, so uh, we're gonna realize a society in which people are freed from the uh, constraints of body, the brain and space and the time. Okay. So our purpose is to, to, to develop the uh, avatar symbiotic societies. Um, so the this project aims to realize an avatar symbiotic society in which the cybernetic avatars allow everyone to perform active social roles without a constraint. And through the uh, teleoperation of a multiple cybernetic avatars that can who fully transmit the uh, user's actions, the intentions and reactions in the scenarios uh, 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 which feature hospitality rich dialogue, uh, the user will be able to take part in various social activities, the uh, works, the educations, and the medical care and daily life and etc. So by 2050, our lifestyles will have uh, uh, dramatically changed and we'll have the uh, a greater freedom in our choice of a location, how we spend our time and the technology and the technological advances will have the enhanced our abilities. And our goal is to develop and implement avatar symbiotic within a symbiosis within a balanced societies. Okay, this is the goal, right? And this this picture shows the more concrete imaginations. So um so anyone's including the everybody uh elderly and the peoples uh with disabilities will be able to uh freely participate in the various activities with uh abilities beyond the ordinary people while expanding their physical cognitive and the uh, perceptual abilities using a large number of cybernetic uh, uh, avatars so anyone they will be able to walk and study anytime anywhere as a minima, uh, minimize commute commuting to work and and have uh, plenty of free time so, so we want to uh, realize this kind of uh, ideal the uh, future societies so if we look at the uh, 
education and the work and the medical and everyday life. So um, uh, as we are doing now, right, the under the coronavirus situations, you know, um, we, uh, we are staying at home and, and, and to study and work and so, but uh, and and many uh, the people are using the uh, um, um, the zooms, but uh, the zoom teleconference system is is not perfect for us. So um, sometimes we want to have a teachers at home, or you know we want to have a partners at home, right? So, but if we use the avatars, you know we can send the teachers and um, to the um, uh, um, to the home, right? And uh, we, then we can uh, send the uh, professionals, um, the professional, the people to support the work, right? And the, um, if we have uh, avatars, you know, the, we don't need to go to the uh, uh, hospitals for checking the our, you know, the, the healthy conditions, um, you know, um, the, for the simple diagnosis, right? We can do it there with avatars. And then on the other hand, at school and uh, and, and and the companies, um, the, we can have uh, rich discussions with ma uh, many kind of people and the people from the uh, foreign countries by using avatars, right? So, so, um, you know, the, we wanna uh, realize this kind of uh, um, avatar symbiotic societies in our futures, okay? And uh, well, um. And uh, and of course, you know, you need to realize that kind of uh, the avatar symbiotic societies. We need to develop the avatar infrastructures. So this, the our infrastructures consist of a three, uh, four modules. The first module is uh, you know user avatar monitoring modules. The second one is uh, avatar experience management modules, and the hierarchical avatar. Uh, cooperation modules, and the last one is uh, operator assignment and the operations, right? So, and um, now we're you know designing this the avatar infrastructures, okay? Um, then you know the after the uh, five years, we're gonna have a uh, 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 world expo uh, in Osaka. I'm a uh, thematic uh, project uh, producers, um, and uh, you know the, this is the imaginations, right? So, uh, well, the important things for the World Expo, um, you know, um, um, so and, uh, we 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 need to use the avatar rods, um, you know, the, even if we have a, a coronavirus situation again after five years, so we expect to have. A, uh, the uh, World Expo in Osaka. So in, in, in order to do that, you know, the well, we need to prepare the uh, avatars and for for the visitors and 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 the workers the uh, in the uh, World Expo, right? So if we use the avatars, we can have uh, uh, new types of a new uh, new type uh, new style uh, of uh, World Explosion. Okay. So anyway, so that is a good chance to appear with our technologies. And um, okay, I think uh, I do not have uh, much time and uh, and I, 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 I'm going to conclude. Now give me uh, the, uh, a, a couple of minutes, a little bit more. Um, so our teams, our teams that consist of uh, uh, the uh, eight, um, uh, mainly the, uh, uh, the uh, well, sorry, the, uh, we have uh, eight teams, and the, and, and um, you know the, that teams are categorized in the uh, four groups. First group is uh, for developing the avatar. The second group is developing the uh, infrastructure. The third group is uh, uh, for the uh, real world uh, world the uh, uh, field experiments, and the uh, group for uh, the. Uh, uh, discussing about the uh, es uh, escalar issues and uh, the uh, unique, we have a unique teams for the biological effect surveys. You now these teams uh, is in the investigate the hormones and hormones and the genes and you know the brain activity, everything about humans and they check uh, checking the effect of able to uh, to the operators and interlocutors. 
So, and uh, well, especially for the uh, ethical issues, if we can you know, uh, the, uh, realize this avatar symbiotic society in, in the society, we need to carefully um, the, discuss about the uh, real world uh, um, an anonymity, uh, anonymity problems and the capacity explosion problems and the multiple existence problems. So, so we may have uh, these problems, right? It's quite uh, important to this, to this uh, discuss about uh, these problems. Okay. And then you know the anyway. So then we hope to have uh, the avatar symbiotic society in the future by solving that problems. Sorry, you know I have yeah, used us, uh, too much time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ishiguro. So uh, for the next project manager is Dr. Kanai Ryota from the Advanced Telecommunications Research Institute International, ATR. Dr. Kanai, over to you. Okay, um, my name is Ryota Kanai. Um, I'm affiliated with ATR as a project manager for this Moonshot project. And in my day-to-day -day life, uh, I also run a AI startup called Araya, uh, where we develop AI applications combined with neuroscience. So, um, so th this is a title um, of our project. And, and so in this project, uh, we try to tackle these societal problems. So, uh, so broadly speaking, I call them limitations of body and the brain and so both you know, body and brain, uh, there are you know, both like negative conditions we want to mitigate and also we want to enhance uh, people's ability. So to uh, mitigate the negative um, conditions, uh, for example, uh, we want to uh, sort of help people uh, who suffer from a loss of muscle control, uh, for example, you know, under the condition of ALS, ALS or you know, in uh, tetraplegic patients. And also like many of us, you know, um, you know, sometime in life suffer from like uh, mental fatigue from uh, like stress at work. And you know, if we can somehow mitigate you know, that kind of suffering you know, that helps a uh, huge number of people. And you know, apart from like you know, fatigue, uh, you know, we could also have suffering from the past traumatic events. And so, so these are uh, potential conditions uh, we want to help with. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also want to uh, help people who want to acquire new skills efficiently, uh, both in terms of uh, like learning like physical skills and also like learning uh, so intellectual skills. And, and also, uh, nowadays, you know, we always you know, multitask, and if we can sort of contribute to many different tasks at the same time, then we can do much more. So, so that that's also a way to enhance uh, people's uh, quality of life. And and, and in a, a similar vein, uh, we also want to be able to uh, communicate faster, so so that we can absorb more information, like in this. Uh, uh, no time of uh, information overload. So, so these are the general directions uh, we want to go. And the method we are going to use is a uh, brain machine interface. So, and in particular, uh, we uh, think about you applying AI to enhance existing uh, brain machine interface technologies, uh, which we aim to use for controlling uh, cybernetic avatars. So, um, so, so this, uh, image shows how uh, uh, generally brain machine interface work. So when we record from uh, the surface of the cortex, uh, we can observe uh, brain activities associated with uh, the hand movement, for example. And but we can use this kind of information to control uh, machines, or for example, a robot hand like this. So so this is the uh, basic concept of a uh, brain machine interface. And of course, uh, to convert information from brain signals to uh, robot control, uh, you know, AI or machine learning uh, have been used for many years, 
but uh, but in the past uh, five years or so, uh, there has been a lot of uh, new progress in the domain of AI, uh, deep learning, and also deep reinforcement learning. So we want to use apply those uh, new technologies to enhance or go beyond the current limitations of our brain machine interface. And but, but the, the uh, video I just showed uh, is about invasive brain machine interface, uh, which implies a surgical implant of electrodes uh, under the skull. And, but, but this cannot be used in everyday life. And so, uh, so we don't limit ourselves just to uh, invasive brain machine interface, but we consider also other approaches at the same time. Uh, for example, uh, non-invasive brain machine interface uses uh, scalp EEG, which uh, does not involve any surgical uh, procedure. So we can, so, so this is uh, not invasive and uh, no, people uh, should be able to use it safely. On the other hand, the problem is it's difficult to uh, attain a high level of performance with the uh, degraded signals uh, available on the surf surface of the scalp. And, and furthermore, uh, we may not even need uh, brain signals to control machines uh, or to make inferences about internal states of people, uh, like psychologically. And so, so we also consider uh, this uh, what we call the contactless BMI. Or in, in a way, it, it doesn't even involve brain, but uh, uh, for example, you know, we can uh, sort of make inferences about uh, people's psychological state only uh, from their gait or facial expressions. So in that sense, we want to sort of use these parallel approaches to find out the limitations of each method. And also uh, we want to uh, sort of use all possible methods uh, for the benefit of the user and the patient. Right, and, and also we want to be user oriented. So uh, we start from this uh, so questionnaire uh, administered to ARS patients um, in collaboration with Japan ARS Association. And so patients with ARS uh, have Inter, uh, interesting, also invasive BMI, uh, about half, half of them do have uh, interest. And th their ma main expectations are in the domain of communication and also physical support. So, uh, so those are the target domains where we want to make a uh, brain machine interface uh, useful. And, and also um, in an earlier slide, I showed you uh, the video of uh, uh, potential brain machine interface, but, um, but but even for patients, invasive brain uh, brain machine interface uh, has not become uh, a normal, a typical treatment yet. So to make it like uh, really available and useful for uh, patients in the future, uh, we need to improve uh, the easiness and uh, sort of efficiency as well as safety and you know, for our users uh, benefit. Okay, and also for non-invasive side, uh, you know, we want, you know, the first thing we are thinking about is to, um, to make a sort of brain machine interface or like self-monitoring uh, more common uh, by uh, creating an application uh, that can be used uh, by any person. Uh, so the, the concept is that, um, so you know, as I said, you know, we may be able to make inferences about people's internal states only, looking, only by looking at their externally observable behavior or non-invasive EEG signals. So, uh, so we want to uh, make this available for people who are interested in sort of monitoring their stress level or sort of uh, making their condition adjusted for uh, best performance in the like, sports competition or musical performance. So that's the uh, idea. And then and what, once, so, so in this project, it's, it's particularly important to make this uh, sort of uh, appealing to uh, 
or typical users. So that way we will be able to sort of uh, uh, increase the user base. And that way we can also collect uh, more data to make our predictions accurate. And as an example, uh, we uh, one of the uh, project members uh, is developing a new method to quantify the efforts needed to perform a given task. So this is actually based on the resting state fMRI data, uh, where we can actually compute the uh, sort of a sort of you know, cost in a like statistical sense to transit from one brain state to another. But, but this kind of a cost estimation seems to be related to uh, how much mental effort is needed to perform a given task. So, uh, but, but conceptually this can be also done uh, also with EEG. So, so that way, you know, we want to be able to sort of quantify how much effort is needed to do a task. And also like, you know, this kind of measure may be also useful uh, for yourself to know why you are, so for example, proc procrastinating uh, for some time and things like that. So that, that's uh, potentially very useful for sort of enhancing your uh, learning performance. And in a like, similar way, uh, we are also thinking about using uh, virtual reality to improve uh, the learning process for athletes. And here, for example, uh, now inside VR, you can change the speed of the time of flow, uh, the flow of time, uh, so slower or faster. So for example, when you're novice, or you may be able to learn uh, much more quickly when you know, everything uh, slows down. And, and once you're a little bit of an expert, you may be able to sort of train uh, in a hard mode uh, you know, by uh, speeding the time. So, so, so we want to show that this kind of uh, training method works in uh, real situations. And also you know, in terms of uh, liberation from the uh, brain limitation. Uh, so you know, as I mentioned, uh, the traumatic experiences can have a severe effect on individuals. So, so we aim to mitigate uh, trauma by modifying the past inside VR. So that's also a, a potentially useful application, uh, non-invasively. And also, um, as I mentioned, like uh, some of the applications uh, are targeted for sort of uh, understanding uh, your own uh, mental state, but, um, but sometimes uh, you cannot control like everything, uh, even if you know you are in a, a difficult condition. And so, um, uh, one of the uh, project PIs, uh, Nishimura's team, um, has been working on uh, the function of uh, nucleus accumbens, uh, which is a, a sort of a brain structure uh, related to motivation. And so, so his team is going to explore the possibility of sort of injecting uh, motivation by directly stimulating uh, the brain. So in a way, um, as I mentioned, we take both uh, invasive, non-invasive and contactless approaches. But uh, well, one of the strengths of going inside the brain is to actually like modify uh, this kind of uh, activity patterns directly. So that's uh, probably a much more difficult uh, with non-invasive method. And finally, um, uh, we, we believe it's very important to make neuroscience trustable for the public. So, so we know that like there are a lot of uh, consumer uh, oriented products uh, using like EEG measures and so on. And, but, uh, but, but some, not all of them are like scientifically evidence-based. So we want to establish guidelines for neurotech applications so that like consumers can trust or they can know which applications actually have an effect. So, uh, so we aim to create this kind of guidelines. And one more thing. Um, so, so as I mentioned earlier, the communication is particularly an important target for our, our brain machine interface. And, and so, so we want to do this in a sort of uh, in stages. So, for example, uh, it is now becoming possible to convert the like, internal speech to actual sound. So that's one of the things uh, we are going to do as well. And, and also we are interested in 
like generating images just by thinking. And also importantly, like in this project, we want to use uh, people's intentions to control avatars. And so, so that's also sort of conversion of brain signals to the output like this. And but in the even longer term, uh, we also want to be able to make brain to brain communication possible. So, so that's also so decoding the int uh, intention or images in the brain uh, may work already, but uh, injecting information to another brain is going to be very difficult. So, so this is a, a domain that where we still need to discover a potential uh, sort of fundamental neural technology that enables this kind of application. Right. And so, so this is the, um, the final slide showing uh, all our team. And so roughly speaking, there are four teams. Uh, so th this blue team uh, uh, involves non-invasive BMI and contactless BMI. And so, um, and then for, for this orange team uh, works on AI applications. So they focus on uh, decoding information from brain signals and also uh, you know, we consider how we can connect different brains when we don't know how to translate like different uh, cores uh, across brains. And then this green team uh, will uh, work on uh, invasive uh, BMI cybernetic avatars. And so we do uh, animal experiments uh, to, uh, to uh, predict their future movement as well as uh, direct stimulation uh, in animals and also like a potential like a clinical uh, sort of testing as well. And then finally, this uh, on a platform team, uh, which is myself, uh, we'll work on this uh, guideline development and exploration of new te technologies. And especially, as I said, uh, we don't know what kind of methods can uh, allow us to uh, inject information to other brains. So you know, we can sort of extract information, but we don't know how to send information directly to the brain. So, so that technology is an open field. And you know, at, at the stage, start of uh, our project, we don't know how to do it, but, but finding such a technology itself is one of the target uh, in our project. Okay, um, that's all. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanai. The next project manager is Professor Minamizawa Kota from Keio University. Professor Minamizawa, over to you. So yes, thank you very much for introduction. I'd like to start introducing our project, which is here. So which is called the Cybernetic Painting Project that is a research on cybernetic, uh, cybernetic avatar technology and social system design for harmonious core experience and collective abilities. So what we are doing is that, so who am I? It's that, so that I'm a professor at Keio University Graduate School of Media Design. So I am uh, come from the information science field, but not only that, I'm also working on the designing the human society or human lifestyles. And also that we are also working on de developing new type of the business models and also the social policies to make it possible to provide, bring the new technology into the society. So then, so my research is about the embodiment, embodied experiences. So I'm running an embodied media project, which is focusing on the empowering or enchanting or emphasizing our kind of experience is we have through our bodies. So we develop a technology to deliver the haptic sensations in the distant places or the kind of the wearables that can share your sensation, that can connect your sensation to the computer kind of the virtual reality field or the kind of the avatar robots that can kind of the make it possible for, the, for you to exist in the different places. So then the, we have developed this kind of technologies of the robotic avatars, like uh, this tele-existence robot enables us to move our bodies, also see the surroundings, and also you can also even touch the object 
around the, using the avatar body. So you can feel as if your brain is directly connected to the robotic avatar. And we can all, of course, we can put this avatar on the distant places using the internet, and we can communicate with this kind of multiple sensations. So then based on this kind of researches, so recently the XPRIZE uh, Foundation launched a new global challenge, which is called NA Avatar XPRIZE. So which aims to create a new technologies and a new avatars that enables the people to work or behave in the very distant places with the sense of kind of the body. So then based on uh, starting from this XPRIZE, so there's many, many startups in United States and also in, in Japan. So there's many companies start to involve in this field. So we also started our new startup, which is called Tele Existence Inc. And also the, also NA, the airplane company also started their startup, which is called Avatar Inc. So then now due to COVID-19, so we are facing the very kind of a uh, very hard situation that we cannot meet physically, but this kind of avatar technologies is now starting to make it possible for the people to meet even in the physical distancing situation. So we are keep our social intimacy in even in the this type of the pandemic. So then in the future, in the near future, in 2022, so the Avatar Express will uh, start uh, start their kind of a competition to proof of concept of human avatars. And also the in the 10 years later, so I think the kind of the NASA and the JAXA, the space kind of the agency is aiming to bring the avatars to outer space. So, and also that we are starting to find the new possibilities by avatars. So the, in these projects, for example, in the left up, it's the project we did with the startups. And uh, in this case, so the, the elderly, it's the, this grammar, it's staying in the hospital, nursing homes, but the grandson have their wedding ceremony. Then the, he would like to invite his grandmother to the wedding ceremony. Then we, we created the avatar that can bring her into the kind of the ceremonies. So now the she is in the nursing home and she 100 kilometers away from the Tokyo, but uh, she could hug the, the new bride, the, the, the new wife of her grandson. So also the, in the Ori Lab, the left up, uh, light up, it's the, another case that we are, our team is doing that the make the people with disabilities enables to work using the robotic avatars. In this case, the, there's many kind of the people with having very serious kind of the disability, physical disabilities like ALS or SMA. So they cannot usually move their bodies or they cannot go out for work. But using this kind of robotic avatars, it is, we can make it possible for, the, for them to communicate uh, and also the, as a kind of a, uh, do a job in the cafe and communicate with the uh, kind of the, the participants and also the customers. So it's not only enabling the, this kind of the physical activities, but also it enables them to have the motivation to, to live. So because usually they cannot communicate with others, but the, their kind of the world is the, the very, very limited. However, if we can make the avatar as their alternative bodies, and if they can move, they can act in the various places using avatars. So it, we can make it possible for them to kind of have more kind of a better life. So we are actually, we are living in a very kind of a highly involved modern society. It's true. However, 
there are still many difficulties to live with. So, and uh, everybody, even us and even you, has a possibility to having various types of disabilities in various reasons. So like uh, physical disabilities, illness, injury, or everybody becomes aging, age, elderly, and also the loneliness is also becoming a big problem. And there's also the language barriers, cultural barriers, also race problems, regional problems. Also the, this kind of a pandemic and also the disasters also uh, give, uh, bring us a new, new type of the disabilities. So, but at eyeglasses, so I have eyeglasses. So if it's without eyeglasses, I have a difficulties. I have disabilities with the bad eyesight. But now there's nobody who are, who are, who feel the bad eyesight is a disability it's because thanks to the eyeglasses and the contact lenses, so we can use them very freely and we can act uh, very freely. So then I believe that the cybernetic avatars could be an option, to new option for us to overcome this kind of the various obstacles that can handle people's well-being in the near future. So we, our kind of the target SDGs are that one is a kind of a promoting empowerment of all the people, including the people with disabilities or including various type of the people with cybernetic avatars, regardless age or disabilities. And also that we can also create new type of the work, working environment that can freely access by everybody. Also the not only working environment, but also the learning environment also the transportation can be changed. So in 2050, so we are aiming to create a new future kind of lifestyle that everybody can use the cybernetic avatar as their another body. So you can have your physical body and also the avatar bodies. So then you can design the cybernetic avatars as you like so that you can customize the kind of abilities and also the uh, also the kind of uh, maybe the uh, uh, representations then you can also exchange the, your skills and experience with other, uh, with with the other people using the avatars so then to make it possible so we are uh, forming a team of the young researchers and also the uh, company uh, uh, company kind of researchers, so researchers from academia and the companies. So I think I believe that so we are the youngest team in this entire moonshot program that mainly uh, consists of the 30s and also the 40s. So then uh, we are aiming to, uh, we think that so that our concept of self could be expanded by avatars. So now we feel, we, we believe that individual is have one body, one name and one identity, but it is now starting to change that so that we have multiple SNS account and we have multiple carriers and we can change our body as, as a budget YouTuber. So then in the new, in the future with semantic avatars, we can have the avatars as another body and we can express various selves. And we can share experience and skills to expand the, the diversity of our life. So then to design this kind of the cybernetic avatars, we will run three types of the researches. One is about cognitive, augment, cognitive augmentation to create, the, to design the uh, cybernetic avatars to change your emotion, to change your behavior. And also the second one is about parallel agency. It makes the you possible to behave or act in the three uh, multiple different places at the same time. And also the collective ability is about using one semantic avatar with multiple people and you can gather your strongness, your, st your strong skills, then to, to create more kind of a superhuman kind of avatars. And also the fourth project is about the creating the platform to connect the people with cybernetic avatars. And also the fifth project is about social co-creation, which is aiming to create actual kind of proof of concept of the uh, usefulness of the effectiveness of the avatars 
especially with the people with disabilities and also the aging people. And the sixth project is about ethics and policy. So because if we have the avatar as our alternative bodies, so we have to change our legal rules that we have in the current society. So we are trying to design the new form, new type of the social rules that can kind of uh, cover this type of the new situation that the one people have multiple bodies. So then the, this kind through this project, so we direct to create the new body sharing pro platform that can help the, with the embodiment. So the help together with embodiment and uh, integrating a various skills and uh, make it possible to simultaneously work in the distant places. Also, we are trying to create a cyber sports which can ex expand your body abilities and sharing experiences across time and space. So this is the final slide. So that I'd like to uh, say that, so that this cybernetic project is aiming to create the future society where people can overcome their disabilities and freely co-create and enjoy a variety of experience and skills and gain more diverse and fruitful life experiences. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Minamizawa. Now it's time to start our final discussion. The moderator of our panel discussion will be Dr. Kitano Hiroaki, President and CEO, Sony Computer Science Laboratories Inc., and a sub program director, Moonshot Goal One. Dr. Kitano, over to you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, uh, good morning or good evening, uh, depends on uh, which part of the world you are in. Now, I would like to start a panel discussion. In this panel, we're very fortunate to have like a very uh, distinguished three uh, panelists. Now, uh, before I go into the discussion, I would like to have like uh, three uh, uh, distinguished guests to uh, uh, present their uh, view on the uh, Cyber Night Avatar Challenge. Uh, so, like, uh, you know, guest uh, for panelists tonight is uh, uh, Professor Leda Takayama uh, from the University of California Santa Cruz and Professor Ed Biden from the uh, MIT uh, Media Lab, or no, uh, McGovern Institute, uh, and uh, MIT McGovern Institute, sorry. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. David Lukey from the uh, XPRIZE. Now I'd like to start from the uh, Leira, when uh, uh, Professor Leira Takayama, uh, uh, over to you. Sure, thank you. All right, so I think I've got five minutes just to share some ideas with you all, um, and then we can get into our discussion, which I'm very excited about. Um, so here we go. Um, thank you for inviting me to join you here today. It's really exciting to get to hear about the Moonshot projects that you've got going on in cybernetic avatars and AI robots. I'm especially excited to be here because I think these projects are sort of actually part of an international movement towards making robots more useful and usable for more people. And to me, it's important to do that. Uh, and it's also quite similar um, to the way that we've seen, for example, personal computers developing, you know, making computing something that anyone and everyone could, could use in their lives, right? So, you know, in the 1950s, mainframe computers were state of the art. Uh, and these were huge, enormous, complex machines that required special access and expertise to be able to use them. But in the 1970s, at places like SRI and Xerox PARC, we saw researchers developing the personal computer, which used graphical user interfaces and mouse-based interactions, right? And these inventions made computing more accessible and usable for much larger groups of people. And today we have supercomputers in our pockets <laughs> that are usable even by very young children, right? So multi-touch interactions, um, the incorporation of cameras, IMUs, and even LIDARs now are making these devices more natural to use just for everyday people. I think we're seeing similar trends in robotics. And this is part of this, this push, this wave towards making robotics more personal and usable. Um, right now, robots are still kind of expensive and complex to use, right? And they need to be operated by highly trained experts. I think making these types of robotic capabilities more accessible to larger groups of people, larger markets, right, um, in, in the commercial speak, I think can help to drive down the cost of robots. And more recently, we've been seeing robots developed 
for people who don't need quite as much training um, as before and can even work alongside people in safer ways, right? They're often called collaborative robots. But I think there's an even further future vision, um, one that I tried to work on in the past where we're developing personal robots, right? That can be used by anyone, anywhere, not only in workplaces, but even in homes. When I worked at Willow Garage on this project, right, we were, again, trying to move in that direction. I don't think we're there yet, but I do think that this is an important movement that we're all trying to contribute to today. Um, you know, today's robots, again, mostly are usable by people with PhDs in robotics um, or by highly skilled, trained professional robot operators. So these are a select few in the world who are amazing. But what if we could make these robots more useful and usable for people who are minimally trained, right? And don't necessarily need to have all of those skills. How do we make this um, accessible for the folks who, for example, want to work in the robot cafe, right? Um, and then maybe even for people who are not trained at all. Um, this is a very high bar for interaction design, but I think making these usable um, for folks who can just walk up to them and pick them up and use them as tools, right? The same way that we use glasses <laughs> or a hammer. That would be pretty cool. There's a lot of opportunities today that are being made possible by more wireless connectivity globally, but also by, you know, higher bandwidth. And access is a critical first step, but we're also still seeing many challenges, right? The people today who professionally operate robots, for example, here, these are deep sea ROV pilots, right? They have remarkable skills and they go through intensive training to be able to do the work that they do using robotic systems. Um, and it's nearly impossible for most of us mere humans to do. The good news is that, you know, we're working on this, right? There is a field of human robot interaction that is growing and it has an increasingly um, diverse set of disciplines that include not only engineering, but also the social sciences, designers, people who think about ethics and values. The bad news is that we're still mostly working on toy problems, right? I think we need to get more grounded in real world applications. And it's exciting to see many of those in place here in this particular um, part of the Moonshots challenges. And I think, you know, while there may be a few places where it's nice for robots to deliver drinks to people, um, at least when we were working on this at Willow Garage, we kept finding that it's actually more valuable to be prototyping robotic services and using teleoperated robots or cybernetic avatars to explore the things that robots might one day be able to do. Um, you know, at Willow Garage, we were trying to develop a personal robot, but we ended up producing telepresence robots that were much more immediately useful for people. There are many technical challenges ahead. I think two of the most pressing ones are really designing teleoperated and autonomous robots for interacting with untrained end users, right? That largest group of people. Um, and part of that challenge is gonna be developing the perceptual systems that can reliably interpret human behaviors, not only speech, but also nonverbal behaviors, human activities, human emotions, and even human intentions. There are also many non-technical challenges, including figuring out which use cases will actually make the world a better place, right? Many times I see companies making robots just for the sake of making robots, which can be fun, um, but sometimes robots are not the best solution, right? Also, there are many hurdles to be overcome in terms of helping people feel less intimidated and more empowered by robots. Um, robots need to earn the trust of people or else they'll get hijacked by people. As we've seen, you know, with things like the Hitchbot, uh, this is a hitchhiking robot that was destroyed by bystanders in the US. It's great to see these discussions and collaborations going on between companies and universities in Japan. I wish we had more of that in the United States. Um, and I think it's really important for us to find overlaps between what could be built and what should be built. Um, and while it is more important for us to develop robots that more people can use, I think there are many challenges ahead for us in the next decade. You know, robots are never going to be perfect. Humans are not perfect. We make mistakes and we sometimes fail. And when we fail, we try to learn from those experiences. And I think real world robots are going to fail and learn from those failures too. But that's going to require the empathy, patience, and forgiveness of people um, for these robots that are learning over time. So thanks for taking the time to hear some of my thoughts on opportunities and challenges ahead for cybernetic avatars and AI robots. And I look forward to our discussion ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, very insightful comments and uh, right, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll come back with all the questions and then our discussion data. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Takayama. Now uh, I would like to move on to the Professor Biden, and uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know uh, again like uh, you know about like uh, five minutes. Uh, Ed, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Long time no see. <laughs> Good to see you too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm a brain scientist and inventor directing a group at MIT, uh, trying to help us understand and engineer the brain. And uh, uh, the topic that we were asked to consider was, well, you know, think about life in 2050, the future of robotics and AI. And so uh, I thought a bit about what this perceptive might look like from a, a basic neuroscientist interested in, in understanding and, and engineering the brain. I guess one thought is, um, you know, 2050, is both a long time from now and not so long from now. And so I thought a lot about, well, what do we really know about the brain? Well, on the one hand, we have big aspirations, I think, as brain scientists, not just to heal brain diseases, but uh, in, in some regards, I would love to see if we could do things like boost empathy or be more enlightened people. You know, we often talk about happiness, the meaning of life, peace, uh, but such goals seem very elusive. So one of my hopes is, you know, the brain is so complicated, if we understood the brain at a deep level, could we understand how the brain represents and processes information related to these functions? And uh, if we're thinking about robotics and AI, I would like to argue that uh, things like the meaning of life or how to be happy or how we can be more enlightened uh, should be great topics to, to include in the, in the table. Now, why is it that we understand so little about the brain? Well, the brain is incredibly complicated. And um, you know, within a cubic millimeter of our brain, you have 100,000 brain cells connected by about a billion connections. And uh, we don't have a map of the brain. We don't know how these brain cells are active. They fire millisecond timescale electrical pulses, um, making the incredible processing of the brain very hard to interpret. And so if we really wanna create technology that makes us happier, that makes our lives more meaningful, that helps us plan and think better, and to be uh, more humane to each other, uh, I think part of the problem is, is that we don't understand the underlying processes of the brain that underlie our outward behaviors. And so one hypothesis that we put forth is, well, if we had better technologies for understanding the brain and uh, repairing it, maybe that would be one way to upgrade our knowledge of the brain's biology so that we can build better technology in our environment and for us. So one thing that uh, we've been doing is trying to build technologies that let us make maps of the brain with great precision and that let us control the brain and read information from the brain. And we've now distributed these tools to thousands of scientists all over the world where they're used to study the brain, how it computes and how it um, goes wrong in brain diseases that affect over a billion people around the world. I'll just mention two very brief examples given that these uh, little mini lectures are very short. On the left-hand side of this cartoon is a schematic of an idea that we call optogenetics. It's a way of controlling brain cells with light. Brain cells compute using electrical pulses, and if we can activate brain cells very precisely, we can figure out what decisions, emotions, behaviors, pathological states, and healthy states they can trigger. And this is work done on animal, animal models. Um, these are not yet approved for any human use, but Thousands of scientists are studying how the brain generates behaviors and such processes as thoughts and decisions and emotions by activating sets of cells. So hopefully we can try to figure out what are the causal influences on what the brain does. On the right-hand side of this image is an example of an expanded brain. We're trying to make maps of the brain, but the brain again is so dense and so complex that there's no machine that can give you a 3D picture of how a brain circuit looks like in all of its complexity. So we developed a way to take brain specimens, infuse them with chemicals like the kind you find in baby diapers, add water and make brain circuits physically a hundred or a thousand or even more times larger. And now they can be imaged using inexpensive microscopes. So I think we're poised in the coming years to understand a lot more about the brain than we have in previous years. And my hope is that by mapping and reading and writing information to the brain, we'll understand the algorithms of the brain. And hopefully that'll be very helpful to understand what does it mean to interface the brain properly. And ultimately I do hope that we can build brain machine interfaces that are ideally non-invasive, that can read and write to the brain using the natural language of the brain. And so 
our group and, and many of our collaborators are working on ideas for non-invasively delivering energy to the brain, uh, or my collaborator Lee Wei Sai at MIT is working on ways to use our eyes and our ears as non-traditional brain interfaces, delivering effectively movies, trying to help uh, treat Alzheimer's disease. So hopefully these neuroscience insights can inspire new ideas of how to build brain machine, brain machine interfaces because we'll know what the language of the brain is. Excited about today's discussion. Thank you very much, Ed, for very insightful comments and with the introduction of up-to-date technology like optogenetics and the expansion microscopy. Well, thank you very much. We'll go back to the old discussion later. And now, the next speaker be, uh, is Dr. Uh, David Lucky, who's uh, working on the uh, XFAR XPRIZE, on the Avatar Challenge. Well, David, where is yours? Okay, how are we here? Is this okay? Uh, it's fine, but it's a little bit occluded on the live side. Oh, yeah, we got it. We got it. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> Sorry, Please. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is David Locke. Uh, I am the executive director of the ANA Avatar X Prize, and uh, I'm really excited to be here this morning. I've had a chance to listen to everyone's talks over the last hour and a half or so, and uh, it's just really exciting conversation to be had. So uh, thank you to the Japan Science and Technology Agency for having me today. Uh, this is the second conference in the series that I've had the opportunity to participate in, and uh, I'm excited about where the program is headed. So uh, typically I would spend about 30 minutes sort of introducing the, the program and our vision of an avatar future, but I, I know time is limited today, so I'd, I'd just like to share a, a quick overview of XPRIZE's mission introduce the ANA Avatar X Prize, as well as address some of the, the, the program's goals. So, um, uh, so some of you might be wondering, what is X Prize? And, and our mission is to inspire and empower problem solvers to positively impact our world. So in order to do so, we leverage large scale global incentivized prize competitions to create solutions to some of the world's grand challenges and moonshots. So instead of trying to solve the problem ourselves or create that technology, we open it up to a global community of, pro of problem solvers to try to help us solve some of these problems and develop these technologies. Uh, we strongly believe that solutions to the world's problems can come from anyone, anywhere. And so uh, quickly, the, the idea of, of these incentivized prize competitions is not new to XPRIZE. Uh, they've existed for centuries. I think one of the most notable one here is, um, uh, is, is, uh, is, is of course, Charles, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh's uh, successful uh, transatlantic flight. Uh, this was part of a, uh, a competition as well as a $25,000 prize. Uh, and many people tried uh, over about the 10 year span that this competition was open and many people failed. Uh, and, and it was Charles Lindbergh who seemingly came out of nowhere to create the spirit of St. Louis uh, to go on and win that prize. And by doing so, he really opened up commercial aviation as, as we know it today. So one man, one small plane, a small prize, a small prize and he went on to really develop uh, the commercial aviation as we know it today. And so with this sort of moonshot thinking in, in, in mind uh, and, and a lifelong dream to go into space, uh, XPRIZE founder Peter Diamandis created the Ansari XPRIZE in 1996. This was a $10 million prize for the first team to fly into outer space twice within a two week period of time. Uh, the Spaceship One was a successful uh, team in that competition. Uh, and that technology went on to go be purchased by Sir Richard Branson and is what we know today as Virgin Galactic. So again, just the, the notion that a, 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 a prize, a team, and, and, a, and, a, and a problem that needs to be solved can come up with really, really great things. And so uh, to date, we have launched about 17 prizes and uh, we've awarded about $75 million. We currently have another $300 million in prizes currently being developed. So uh, with that, this leads us to the ANA Avatar X Prize, uh, which was launched in March of 2018. And some of you might be wondering why Japan's leading airline is looking to create a robotic avatar system. And uh, they, uh, ANA and XPRIZE quickly learned that our ability to physically experience uh, other geographic locations or to provide on the ground assistance where needed is, list, is limited by distance and time. And so we think it's time for a disruption. 
Uh, we think avatar technology can help bypass these limitations, allowing us to more rapidly and efficiently distribute our skills and hands-on expertise to distant geographic locations where they are needed uh, and basically transcending the barriers of distance and time. And so the a and Avatar X Prize is a four-year, $10 million competition that challenges teams to create a physical, remotely operated avatar system. Uh, this, this system could enable human, uh, a, a human operator to embody a robot at a distant location as feel, and feel as if they are truly present where the avatar is. So uh, an avatar will be able to see, hear, and interact within that distant environment. So again, see, hear, touch, connect, be able to interact with that environment. Um, we came to realize very quickly that avatar technology can only satisfy a number of needs, at, but at its core, especially in this early adoption phase, the, the competition is really focusing on the ability to connect a humans to humans. So I think what separates this prize from the dozens of other robotics competition out there is a requirement to establish a sense of presence meaning the avatar must serve as the conduit to establishing this human to human connection. But avatars of course have many possibilities and, and one of them is uh, transporting your skill set. So we think potential applications are, are, are endless for this. Uh, you know, the technology could be adopted by doctors and teachers, construction workers, farmers, uh, conducting business meetings, the list goes on and on the ability to transport your skill set to another location. And of course, exploration. Uh, you can use the avatar to go anywhere in this world and perhaps beyond. Uh, somebody had mentioned space avatars earlier and that's something that we are certainly interested in. But I think that's really, you know, that's, that's gonna become it in, in more years. Right now we're really focused on the human connection. And so we realized that winning this X Prize is gonna require a collaborative approach between teams across a, a many different fields of technology and engineering, of course, robotics, telepresence, AI, advanced sensors, haptic, uh, the list goes on, goes on and on. And we're really encouraging our teams who, who, uh, who have expertise in any of these specific technologies to collaborate and work together to come up with the winning solutions. So uh, quickly, I just wanted to share a, a, a look at our current qualified teams. This is broken down by country. As you can see, the US is in the lead with 27 teams. However, we also have 14 teams from Japan, which is the most I think I've ever seen uh, in this region in any of our X Prize competitions. Uh, again, teams come from all walks of life, universities, startups, corporations, individuals, people working in their garage. It, it's really a really a broad spectrum. Um, and something important that I wanted to announce, and I wish I could have shared more today, but we'll be announcing our semifinals teams on April 5th. This is gonna be a major milestone for the competition. Uh, we're gonna be promoting it heavily. We'll have a video that will be showcasing the avatars and the technology that the teams have been working on over the past two years. So this will be the first time that we've shared the technology that the teams have been working on with the public. So this list of 75 teams is gonna dwindle down uh, but we've got some really exciting tech and we're really excited to share it with everybody. So please uh, look out for that announcement on April 5th. Um, lastly, I, I was just asked to, to talk a little bit about what the opportunities and challenges are of, of avatar and, and, and AI robots in society. And for us, we think the opportunities are endless. Uh, for the first time ever, we'll have the opportunity to transport ourselves anywhere in the world. Uh, and again, we're really focused on the idea of human connection to start, and we will expand by transporting skills and expertise as well as exploration. But there's so much more. I think that a lot of people came up with some really great concepts today. Uh, quickly, the, the cons that we see is public adoption. Uh, it's very difficult for people to accept the idea of, of adapting to new, new technologies until they can physically experiment uh, with and understand how the technology will not replace human interaction, but instead enhance it. Uh, we do not expect avatar technology to become everyone's first choice when it comes to engaging with each other. However, it does open a world of possibilities uh, and you can use that technology to connect with loved ones, perhaps while you're away. Uh, and lastly, we wanna make sure that everyone is using the technology for good. Uh, this is important because for many people, the thought uh, or an image of a robot brings a lot of negative co connotations and we fear that Robots are, and that people will fear that robots are dangerous or will take away or take over our daily lives in a negative fashion. However, the truth is we're already surrounded 
uh, and supported by robots in our daily lives from refrigerators, laundry machines, our cell phones, the components of this technology has already arrived. Now it's just a matter of integrating it to best serve mankind. And with that, uh, I, I will stop and of course, happy to answer any questions that come up in the, in, in the chat room. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for the great presentations and overview of the expert. Okay, now we're going to move into the discussion sessions. So, like everyone, uh, including all the PIs on the avatar chat, uh, not avatar chat, like a moonshot, please put it coming on. Okay, uh, but we're going to start. Okay, uh, I have a few questions to the uh, all the uh, you know, visiting uh, speakers and the panelists, I'll say. Uh, later, uh, Professor Takayama, you know, you mentioned that the robotics still working mostly on the toy problems. So obviously, like this is a big issue. Now, industrial robotics, this is a big win. There's no doubt about it. It yeah. transformed into. Aside from that, like a home robot and now robot that, that town. I mean, the Roomba, for example, cleaning robot. You know, that's only thing that's consistently actually sold in the market. And actually, I just did all the Roomba my house like before this. But I just, uh, <laughs> I'm actually having a dinner, you know, that was very useful because it doesn't do much, you know, but it's just a clean thing, which is essential. So like, uh, you know, why we're not getting out from this toy problem issues? Are we being too ambitious? So like, uh, what I hit problem because like, uh, you know, in this robot, because you can design the environment. Like if you got the home or like office or even in the street, it's open-ended, unstructured environment. And, yes. you know, it's like, you know, what is the bottleneck and how are we going to get out from this? This is really critical because Moonshot is about like, accomplishing something and then unless we define how to get out from uh, you know toy problem issues we'll never achieve the moonshot but this is a very critical important question i totally agree i mean when irobot came up with the roomba they had already gone through many many dozens of other application ideas before um so if you talk with them about how did you end up with a vacuum cleaner like why did you decide a robot should suck dirt <laughs> um, the real answer is they prototyped a whole bunch of different applications for mobile robots. And that was the one that resonated with customers, right? And so you actually need to try and prototype and put it in front of real customers in order to figure out what's useful. And I think in robotics academic research, right, we tend to want tractable problems where we know we're going to have success. We don't take risks. And so we make structured environments where you stack some blocks <laughs> or you, you paint all of the glass cups opaque so that it's easy for a computer vision algorithm to grasp it, right? And use plastic, not glass. <laughs> um, and I think that's fine for research research, right? But I think for making a difference in the real world, we need to put our prototypes out in the real world with those real users. Yeah. Otherwise we can't learn. Um, and I think that actually the cybernetic avatars are a super powerful way to prototype, even for autonomous robots, right? We can prototype now using hardware that we have now with human brains, right? To, to operate them and do things that maybe autonomous robots can't do just yet but we can try to figure out if it's even worth making those things autonomous before we invest all the time um, in making those autonomous capabilities. So in human computer interaction, we talk about that as wizard of ozing. So you wizard of oz and pretend that the system really works before it really does, just so that you can get the idea in front of real, real users early, right? And figure out if this is even worth pursuing. I, I love my Roombas too. I also have a lawnmower robot that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you. So Those are the killer yeah, apps. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting about that stuff, Roomba is actually, it does only one thing. Mm. It just clean thing, but it's yes. not going to do like a match. Rest you know, is not general in, purpose. In, in terms of this uh, avatar challenge, I mean, <laughs> I keep saying confusing. <laughs> the moonshots, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, okay, so this is uh, a moonshot. We, we are, you know, talking about like, uh, you know, really ambitious target because we have like a much more long, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of sort of uh, over the horizon in terms of the uh, goal and the project term setting. But still, like, uh, you know, we probably need some low hanging fruits or some tangible thing before yes. we went at 250. So, like, do you have like any idea on what a possible, like, uh, sort of low hanging fruits, or, like an intermediate milestone, what, what can be accomplished, uh, which can be the really the bigger goal in the future? Yeah, I mean, for now, at least given the state of the art in robotics, doing things with mobile robots <laughs> is, is safer, right? Yeah. As opposed to manipulation with seven degree of freedom arms, right? Like we will get there. It'll just take a little longer, a lot longer maybe. 
um, some low hanging fruit, I think, is going for pain points um, and value propositions that are very strong right now. Mm -hmm. So I actually think, you know, the X prize is exciting because human connection mm -hmm. is incredibly important. We've seen, especially during this COVID pandemic, that when we don't have as much human connection, mental health, right, issues rise. Um, and that has implications for other kinds of medical health. And I think so loneliness is one of the pain points that I think we can make a very big difference with right now. Um, so I think I the cybernetic avatar approach to that is brilliant. Um, and it's something like it doesn't it doesn't need to be very high fidelity, right? It doesn't need to be fully multimodal from the very beginning, yeah. but we can create human connection with very minimal design. And I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, I think that's interesting because like, uh, now you're talking about this loneliness or more the psychological aspect on the mm -hmm. more the human touch as opposed to the, uh, you know, Roomba, which is, uh, you know, not much of the human touch, but it does things, you know, yes. so I think it's like a, into like a, a kind of different quality. Yeah. Uh, you know, function idea. Yeah, it's a very different. Thank instance. you very much. I mean, uh, you know, now, now we're talking about like a slow hang fruit. So, like, I want to go to like a David. You know, obviously, uh, you know, X Prize, like an avatar challenge, uh, it has like a goals and then you have like a, you know, multiple potential goals, like a connect connections and explorations and uh, all that. And uh, how you envision like, uh, you know, uh, winning uh, a successful avatar could be. You know, it's gonna be like uh, uh, more like uh, what the leader uh, insists right now for like a more psychological or like a human touch or what like a multifunctional, lived, ambitious one. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, and it's something we have to think a lot about as we design the competition and our rule set. We don't want to jump the gun and make things too challenging that it's not achievable, right? We use that 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 framework a lot. It needs to be audacious but achievable. So for our semifinals, uh, you know. From a physically, from a physical standpoint, the bar might seem really low. We're not asking the teams to do a lot. You know, maybe put a puzzle together. Maybe, um, uh, you know, maybe have some type of mobility. But the real goal and what we'll actually be judging the teams on is not what you can see uh, on a screen at all. It's how does it feel to embody the avatar system, and how does it feel for the recipient on the other end to to interact with that avatar. So the physical capabilities, while they have to be, while they, they do have to have some physical capabilities, we're really focused on that sense of connection and presence that you get with the avatar. Uh, and it's it's been something that we've had to work really really hard on using both our judges and our advisors who have you know uh, knowledge throughout the industry and many different capabilities and spaces to help us get to this point. So uh, again, I think the world is used to, uh, when they think of robots, it's, it's the vacuums that we've talked about here today, as well as also, you know, Boston Dynamics and the robots doing backflips and cartwheels and dancing. That's not really our focus. I see. Boy, I mean, very interesting. I mean, and let me ask you one more question. I mean, uh, Avatar Challenge, I mean, you have like a goal, which is a relatively broad scope as far as I understand, rather than, uh, you know, you know, specific, specifying like uh, we accomplish this and this and this, like, uh, you know, so like, uh, is that like a goal, like, uh, you know, progress measurement? You know, are you actually assuming that like, uh, those would be emerged out of the discussions and you know, we can dynamically set like a uh, next target or, you know, how, how are you going to manage that the, uh, you know, uh, mission statement or like, you know, inter intermediate milestones? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. We, we um, uh, you know, we do have milestones. So the big one that we'll be coming up with on April 1st, on April 5th, excuse me, is the announcement of our semifinals teams. Mm. So all those 79 teams that I mentioned earlier, they all had to submit written submissions to us explaining what they've been doing for the last two years, but more importantly, submit video of their avatar physically working. And yeah. so from that video, we, were, we had asked teams to create their own scenarios to showcase the capabilities and strengths of their system. And then we will be choosing the teams that will be moving forward to semifinals. So once we get to semifinals, we'll have a really good idea of what the, what the teams are capable of, where, they, where, 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 where they're at, and then we'll make things even more difficult at finals. Mm. So uh, one of the things I'd also like to point out is that yes, we, we are creating and putting teams through the scenarios that we create. However, both in semifinals and finals, we're giving teams an opportunity to create their own scenarios yeah. to really show what their avatar strengths are. So in the semifinals, they'll submit a video that we'll review and watch and judge the team. But in the finals, 
the teams will be able to actually in person showcase uh, through one scenario uh, what their what their avatar is really capable of. So it's yeah. not just us imposing what we want to see the avatar do, or allowing the teams that freedom as well. I see. I see. Thank you very much. I got one quick question. You know, COVID actually impacted our life a lot. I mean, you know, we won't be able to meet uh, people, uh, you know, physically most of the case, and the international travel is pretty much like uh, impossible unless everyone gets vaccinations. Okay, so does the COVID actually impact like a way that people participate in terms of not, not only in a physical interaction, but like uh, in a way they how you, you how they expect to use the avatar in the real society in the future i think there must be a you know big uh, you know uh, shift in the ideas or like uh, influence the way we live yeah yeah I, and two things come to mind for this so one is when i mentioned earlier that we had the team submit video uh, for the semifinals and we allow the teams to create their scenarios many of them a majority of them were doctor patient interactions so I see. for a doctor to be able to interact with a patient remotely to perhaps provide a vaccine or test them for the COVID. And I think that really opens up, especially for communities where maybe there aren't doctors, right? So as long as you have a, maybe a, a series of avatars in a particular community uh, of avatars, but not doctors, doctors can access that avatar and actually perform these tests in that remote, in that remote location. And then, of course, the one other thing that comes to mind for me, uh, and we've talked about a lot about loneliness, is but you know the COVID has changed our 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 sort of daily interactions, right? Many of us had to be home, and many of us were alone. But if we had avatars in our homes, we would be able to interact with others in remote locations and really feel maybe not as alone, but we were able to have that sense of togetherness uh, interacting with that avatar. So uh, those are two I think, big points that come that hit home today. I uh, think you about, that's very interesting. Lila, want to say something? I just wanted to add during the winter holidays, we had our telepresence robot in our house and family members visited via the robot. It was great. They could chase the cat around the house, see the presents. It makes a big difference. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I actually kind of hate to go around, uh, you know, meet physically uh, in any of the meetings. So I ask like a ANA guys, avatar in guys to, uh, you know, let's deploy the avatar for some of the meeting and interaction with with avatar, physical presence robot is very different from the Zoom or Teams, right? Because like there are something physically out there. So I feel like, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, difference, uh, you know. Uh, so I think this is really the uh, in- interesting point, actually. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And then also, like I noticed, like uh, ANA because of difficulty the international travel, which would not not gonna go back as you uh, as a uh, pre-COVID days uh, anytime soon. So I think they are. I can't speak for ANA, but I, I feel like are trying to reposition themselves to be the company for like a telepresence or like a, you know present you know make people present in anywhere either physically or uh, or uh, digitally. You know, so I think like that's very interesting transformation uh, industrial. Uh, as well. And uh, I'd like just put one quick point to that is ANA saw this future even before COVID hit. Yeah, that's right. That, that's an amazing thing, actually. They made a yeah, good that move. Need, that need was there and it's been further cemented after after COVID. We realize now more than ever. So yeah. hats off to, to, to ANA. Right, right. I, I think this is a very interesting point. Okay, but I don't want to you know, break a head of uh, boring. <laughs> I mean, I go back. I, you know, one of the like uh, kind of projects actually, uh, particularly like uh, Kanaisan's project, uh, we're talking about like a BMI. Okay, so like, uh, you know, this is really cybernetic avatar means uh, multiple things. Cybernetic means like, uh, you know, brain machine interface and that's like a human robot interaction. So it's a matter of degree, how we're going to interface with robotics and in a society of the, you know, multiple avatars and the humans, uh, you know, working together. So like, you know, one way is actually human robot interactions. Uh, but the other way is like, you know, getting a bit more aggressive stance is like we're merging uh, robotic systems, uh, AI and the human, uh, you know, neural system basically, right? So like uh, sometimes that works. I mean, uh, but it's still really challenging. You know, you have like either you have like this optogenetics and then uh, you know all the uh, uh, expansion microscope. You you are thinking about the really how you 
measure the brain at the precision and able to control uh, what are the single neurons by the optogenetics. And, uh, you know, how you see the future of the BMI? Is this something like, I mean, practical? Of course, like, uh, we know, like, what the Elon Musk is doing and all that, like, uh, electro things. But, like, uh, uh, do you envision this, like, uh, what, what would the fu future of the BMI might look like? Sure. Yeah, so I'm excited about brain machine interfaces. And I, and I think there's two big challenges, which I'm very excited over the coming five, 10 years will become more and more clear, hopefully. One, of course, is the unpredictability of the brain. So we've all had experience where you notice a sign on a shop window or you see um, a newspaper clipping on the street and it brings back a memory from childhood or you know a recollection of, a, of an old friend you haven't talked to in years or something like that. And, and arguably that's what makes the brain so interesting, right? That's what makes us intelligent. That's what makes us creative. If we were predictable, then I don't think we would call ourselves you know, creative or intelligent if we just did exactly what, you know, a reflex uh, um, within us does. So partly I think the issue that uh, I'm very excited about in the coming five or 10 years of brain machine interfaces is can we really understand what the brain does with information? Because if there are unpredictable outcomes, um, we need to understand what those might be, right? And this is really the challenge and, and the payoff, I think. So one thing I'm very excited about with optogenetics, with expansion microscopy, is that people are trying to understand what happens when you stimulate certain parts of the brain. Oh, that part will trigger a memory. This part will cause a recall of an emotion. But people are also discovering that if you stimulate the brain in certain ways, you can cause a false memory. You can cause a pathological change. And so my hope is that we'll sort of understand the operating system of the brain, so to speak, uh, in the coming decades. And that will help us build brain machine interfaces that really as I was alluding to earlier, speak the language of the brain and allow us to communicate and augment ourselves, but in the way we want to be augmented, right? We want to, you know, I use the word enlightenment in the little five minute mini talk and um, it's sort of an odd word, I think, to use as a neuroscientist because uh, we don't talk about it very much in neuroscience. But mm. I do feel that uh, if we can understand what's going on in the brain and use that understanding to help us figure out where we want to go as a species, mm. where do we want our brains to go in the future, then that could help us inform the brain machine interfaces. Yep. And the other aspect is the hardware. You know, we need to have the, the physics and the chemistry to interface at the right level of resolution so we can speak that natural language of the brain. Yeah. I mean, you know, one, one thing about the BMI is the how we want to, you know, control the brain, more like, a, you know, uh, interface with the brain. And you, you show like a one diagram, actually, slide saying that you have like all the, uh, uh, you know, uh, some like, uh, I think it's like electric like interference. You have like a envelope generation. Mm -hmm. it, it, do you think that is a kind of promising technology to get like, a, you know, impacting the uh, neural at the high resolution uh, even for the human being? Yeah, great question. So I think that um, a lot of us in brain machine interfacing have been thinking about the physics of how to deliver energy to the brain yeah. and read energy from the brain. Mm -hmm. But I think it's one of the, the most exciting areas is also the, the intersection of the physics and the biology. Brain cells will have natural frequencies that they want to go at and natural uh, patterns that they want to fire at. And if we can deliver our physical forms of energy in ways that match those, then we might be able to get particularly powerful responses out of the brain. And so uh, as you uh, alluded to, we've been working on this way to try to get multiple signals to then interact thanks to the nonlinear properties of brain cells. So two signals will come in and mix and make a third signal, which is different from the two that you put in. And the advantage here might be that you can be more focal and get information to a more specific part of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so the technique that, uh, that I mentioned, the interference method uh, is indeed being explored now in human trials. And also we're working on understanding the mechanism at the biology level so we can try to build new versions as well. So well, yeah, hopefully that'll have well, some- that, that, That's very really exciting development. And as far as I understand, I mean, but there's like, a, we can pr probably like, a, if you go like a visual cortex, like a V1, for example, there's like a, all the oscillated resonance in your columns that I, I, I think, uh, you know, so we can uh, see like how the, the device can influence like a primary visual cortex, for example. So we can actually get the people to see some image, which is like a directory interfacing, uh, you know, intervening to the uh, V1 region. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So I think um, for sensory input to the brain, for motor readout from the brain, yeah. uh, those are areas where I think uh, progress uh, is, is going to be very rapid in the years to come. To interface to thoughts, decisions, and emotions is a more yeah. complicated, of course, yeah, yeah, because yeah. of all the unpredictability of it. Yeah. But I love the idea of visual augmentation. And actually, 
um, some of our optogenetic molecules, um, two of them are, are um, being explored for treating human uh, blindness. So people who lost see. their photoreceptors in their eyes could restore vision to the eye uh, using these molecules. Yep. And so, the, so we're so using hope, like, uh, th that means like uh, you're going to restore like all the part of the retinal functions rather than intervention in of V1, but you're going to have like all the uh, 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 retinal, uh, you know, neural system. Well, again, it, we're, we're kind of limited by our biology knowledge. In the retina, yeah, we sure. know quite a lot about what cell types receive information of certain mm. kind, mm. how is information about motion and, and color and so forth encoded. And so there's, I think the retina is a very good place to start. But mm. my hope is that as we understand more and more uh, different circuits, we can design yeah. brain machine interfaces that are optimal for those yeah, circuits. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, also, like we may be able to use that for the premotor cortex, for example, like uh, see how we can actually uh, insert, like uh, you know, control of uh, motor cortex and the premotor cortex associated with the uh, uh, motion. So, like uh, one of the uh, member on the, uh, I think that was the Kanai's group, was that uh, try to get the heavy undoing of the uh, brain wave detection and then uh, rehabilitation, the muscle movement. So mm -hmm. because like uh, you know, without that, we just like uh, trying to have like a muscle movement. It's not, uh, it doesn't really learn. I mean, there's like a, uh, it's not much learning progress going on. But like if they're associated, uh, you know, but then we can have like a, this is going to heavy undoing, so have like a much more effective in terms of rehabilitation. Yeah, and can we learn more about how these neurons encode information and how they change? Mm -hmm. um, one of my colleagues at MIT, for example, has been studying the visual system, and they find in the visual system, just a couple connections in from the eye, mm -hmm. emotion signals, reward signals are there. And so the brain, I don't think, is quite as modular as we used to think in neuroscience. Yeah. And it's both difficult, means we need to learn more, but it's a great opportunity because it means that with the proper algorithm, maybe you can extract very interesting kinds of information, even from a single brain region. That that's very really interesting. Okay, but let me actually expand the discussion involving all the PI or the Moonshot project. Something directly related to that, what we are talking with the Ed right now is the Kanaisan approach in the BMI. Kanaisan, yeah. uh, you have uh, probably uh, you know more, you, you are desperate in making some comments on this discussion. I guess uh, Kanaisan, uh, what's your what's your take on those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, like, as I uh, mentioned in, in my talk, uh, we, we are very limited in terms of technology we can use for like, recording and also like injecting information, and especially st stimulation part seems to be uh, extremely difficult. And so, so I wanted to hear uh, from Ed, you know, what kind, you know, if, if he expects like, you know, new kind of technology that we could use for like, you know, really like, you know, fine grained, Brain machine interface and and also like you know you mentioned that um, you know natural language of the brain so so that kind of makes me think that maybe we don't need to have like, all the detailed information from single neurons but instead maybe we may be able to use more microscopic uh, signals so so I want to hear your thought on this yeah great questions so in response to your first question I think there's a lot of interesting possibility at the intersection between multiple fields. I mean, one thing that I, I'm very intrigued about is, could you build a physics chemical hybrid strategy? Suppose there's something that you could inject in the bloodstream. So with no more invasiveness than a, a COVID vaccine, let's say, you could have something go into the bloodstream, which of course will go into the brain. Mm -hmm. And if that could interact with energy in some way, could you stimulate the brain in a way that is essentially non-invasive, but could be far more precise. And so it's mm -hmm. exciting to see people start to think about ways of delivering neurotechnology into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as the other question about, you know, can we get more coarse information out of the brain? Absolutely, yeah. So I think as we learn more and more about the underlying neuroscience, mm -hmm. how the circuits are connected, how the dynamics occurs, that information can help us sort of like a prior to help us interpret more um, coarse information from the brain. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that you know, as we learn more about the neuroscience, that'll feed into the algorithms to help us build better brain machine interfaces which will then in turn drive more neuroscience. And so there'll be a great positive feedback loop, I hope in the years to come. Mm. Oh, great, thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention was, I, I think it's very unusual for a, a research program to start uh, without knowing what kind of technology to use. <laughs> in my sort of a proposal, uh, I'm saying, okay, I don't know how to do it, <laughs> but we look for it. So, so I think, uh, that's a big unique character of this moonshot uh, project. 
Yeah, I, I think this is an interesting part of the moonshot because you, you got to specify the dream. So like a, well, it's a very tangible one. It's not like an unrealistic one. You got to audible, you know, audacious, but like, a, you know, achievable goal. It's not easy, but achievable goal. And then, you, you know, you know, start thinking about what you can use. Actually, you have to develop the same technology. I mean, you know, moonshot is about like accomplishing the mission. So you, you really have to really work on that new technology to be developed uh, to the accomplish mission. So I mean, it's interesting because we're talking about like a brain and we have going to have uh, rapid progress on the understanding of brain functions much more than before because of the new technology a readout and possibly the information processing and associated with their uh, human emotional status or cognitive status and the motor uh, control and then I uh, you know you know I like to connect this to like a, a, a point very interesting point raised by Rera like uh, you know she expects like uh, this uh, one of the new functions this uh, possi possible opportunity is about like a loneliness or some of the uh, emotional quantity that probably uh, uh, it's been really ambiguous so far so like we couldn't really relate to that but like with like a measurement that we can have we might be able to have some sort of emotional content uh, measurable well, we don't know yet but like I probably much better than uh, much better odds than uh, before and then I'd like to ask Ishiguro san uh, uh, on this like how you, you have like a lot of experience like uh, interfacing with the uh, elderly person or kids or all that and then they're interacting robot and then you you know experiments is a uh, robot is not really focusing on uh, robot technology per se I mean you have like technology great technology but uh, you are focusing more on the human side of the impact of the when a uh, robot is brought into the scenery how human emotional interactions uh, uh, transformed you know with that regard you know what is your uh, you know uh, what's your goal in accomplishing this uh, uh, for example, like Alera says, like uh, loneliness may be uh, somewhat resolved or might have like a different approach to the uh, people who might feel lonely. And uh, from what you experienced, what you can say on this? Well, so um, I, I think that, you know, the, uh, uh, the important thing is to provide the various robot for the various people. You know, the people may have uh, the, the, you know, the many kind of situations, uh, but, you know, the elderly and the um um well the um how can I say that uh, um uh, you know the what i want to say is uh, you know we 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 should allow the uh, more barriers the human robot relationship the human human relationships you know the people may uh, want to have uh, uh, the something different the uh, human relationships right so the human human is a kind of a constraint in some sense right so we have the human body is uh, you know the always people they expect to have relationships with the human this is a kind of a, you know the uh, 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 the uh, uh, the constraint right now sometimes we want to talk with the robot and some, you know sometimes we can trust a robot so so if we compare the uh, in the human robot which is you know the, which we can trust right they usually you know that we we choose the robots more right <laughs> you know and so um um well and i i i i think i i cannot do the the answer to the equation the correct but uh, you know the um uh, according to the situation, that, uh, well, the, what I want to say is that we, we should give uh, more the uh, freedom to the uh, people, you know, the, and the freedom to have uh, the uh, various relationships with uh, with humans and robots. <laughs> and, yeah. and then, you know, that we can solve the, you know, some emotional problems more. <laughs> right. Yeah. <So. laughs> yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah. I think I got uh, Minamizawa-san. You have uh, some interesting your projects that are focusing on the multiple like uh, uh, human identity issues. I mean, of course, yes. like uh, you, Shiguro san mentioned like uh, you know multiple robot interfacing with the various people, various situation. You have a uh, you know probably at the end of the day you're talking about like a somewhat similar thing, but like, you have a distinctly different approach. Uh, to identify that, uh, you know, how you address like uh, this like a uh, uh, psychological nature uh hmm. of this uh, human uh human robot interaction like how you resolve loneliness like uh, how you resolve like a uh, more the uh, emotional part of the uh, human issues using this cybernetic avatar mm -hmm. yeah fr from our perspective so we think avatars as our body so i think that maybe there's uh, some difference between the ishiguro project and my project that that i think the 
different focus is that the avatar as your partner or avatar as your body. So then from our side, it's the we think avatar as our body. Then body makes experience and experience makes our personality. So that if we can change our body, so we can change our personality. So we are I, we think we ourselves of human being is now really constrained by the our natural bodies. So then if you if I I I am born in Tokyo and I'm I'm a uh, kind of a male, in that case I cannot actually kind of understand what the female females in Africa is thinking about because that there's many many differences and in the kind of our life and our cultures. But if we just have uh, another body that can actually kind of being that person, so we can actually maybe understand who what they are thinking about. Mm -hmm. So this can create, I think, the new, new style of the new way of the human kind of connection that we can really understand ourselves, each other, and really kind of collaborate together in the more like a body level. So this is, I think, the, we don't, actually, we don't want to say it's robot because it's body. It's not the your partner, but it's yourself. So that is, I think, the, our kind of the, uh, direction to tackle that tackle the kind of a new uh human consciousness bringing by the avatars well thank you very much minamizawa san uh, i think you raised a very important issue because what you're saying is basically uh people got to experience someone's like uh, positions like uh, you know situations and physically being there or like uh, being the proxy using avatar to do that. And then mm. of course, like there are all issues and minority issues and difference in the cultural thing. And uh, you know, people talking about it, talking about may not be sufficient. I mean, it may not be enough. I mean, you have to be in the position to be in a specific uh, environment for be able to understand, uh, you know, f- you know, situations or like, uh, well, but like uh, you know, psychological status of the, the yeah. individual. Yeah. I think that's really uh, that could be a really new use case or like a new uh, opportunity for the avatar yeah. to be used. Yeah, actually, that's true. That so the I think the several social problems now happening by the this type of the uh, lack of the embodiment in the digital networks. So that in the uh, social networks, we sometimes kind of uh, discuss only with the text, and uh, it's sometimes kind of uh, create the very kind of the. Uh, uh, the de- de- divide between the mm-hmm. people and the people and community and community and the community. But if we have the kind of bring the embodiment and the experience, a sharing experience to the this kind this kind of digital world, I think we can recreate the new uh, new type of the human connections yeah. in the kind of a global scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's important. Oh, yeah, uh, Edorera or uh, David. Oh, uh, I just wanted to. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, David first and then Rita then. Sure, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah as, as part of our judging and scoring, the, this operator and recipient experience is, is uh, vital to the competition. So we identified a number of ways that you could feel a sense of presence. Uh, and one of it was be able to have a sense of presence. Do you understand the space that you're in? Can you move around and understand where you're at? Can you understand the gestures of the recipient and can the recipient understand the gestures that you are making as well? And can you touch and feel somebody and feel uh, and actually be able to establish that that sense of of connection? So it's really, really important. And the more than anything, the experience of the operator and the experience of the recipient are what teams will be judged on. That's the majority uh, of the points. So again, not what you're physically able to do, but that experience, that sense of presence and connection that you're able to make with others. So we, we do have a number of interesting, um, um, uh, you know, uh, factors that we can use to score that, that sense of presence that I think will be a first uh, when we get to semifinals testing. And these, um, these, gui- these guidelines are available in our rules and regulations. So you can find these online if anybody is doing studies on their own of how we are interpreting that sense of presence and connection. Thank you yeah. very much, Andrea. I just wanted to to build on that. I think there is a very big opportunity for building empathy for other mm-hmm. points of view based on an embodied experience that remote operators have. So um, my coworker, he's about six feet tall 
and I'm closer to five foot two. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we made the robots my height. Mm-hmm. Um, and we made him go to a party in the robot. And so he experienced going to a party at my height. And he did not like it. He said, no one's looking at me. I'm looking at people's shoulders. This is not fun. And I told him, you know, welcome to my world. <laughs> this is what it's like to be shorter, not taller. And he actually got a lot better about um, now when I see him in person, he'll sit down to talk to me. He understands yeah. in a visceral way what it's like to be shorter as opposed to taller. And I think that's made a positive difference in our, in our working relationship. Um, we even ran experiments also. You may have heard of the Proteus effect, I'm sure. Um, when you make a virtual character taller in a virtual world, people act more dominant. And when you make a virtual character shorter, people act more submissive. And it carries throughout not just the virtual interaction, but later on in the real world too. So Jeremy Balenson and Nikki did a lot of really interesting work there that I think is empirical evidence um, that we're going to be able to build empathy for other types of bodies that people live um, in. Yeah. Well, I think it's a very inter- interesting point, actually. I got to the Ishiguro side, but I, I'd like to... Uh... <laughs> Well, you know, comments on the uh, what the leader pointed out, and you know, I had a conversation with the uh, robotic startup company called Temuzak, and he has been creating the single passenger, uh, you know, uh, you know, vehicle. And in uh, early development, he actually used it for the uh, spinal cord injury person. And uh, you know, what he told me was very uh, interesting that reminded me. Uh, that uh, all the people who are using like a wheelchair, what they don't like it is height. Mm-hmm. The people with the hoiche, you know, when you interact with other people, you have to look up all the time. That actually impacts you know, the social status or like, yes. uh, you know, they don't like mm-hmm. it. So, so like uh, this like, company, they like, uh, create like a, uh, you know, wheelchair equivalent. They can lift up so you can actually talk to people in the same eye level. And that has like a huge impact in psychology for the individual. I think that's really impact and you have to experience then you understand it. And then this yes, would be the really absolutely. great uh, opportunity for the cyber, cyber government to resolve some of the cultural and the minority issues and all that because you experience it. And it's Shiguro san Yeah, well, the later point is very important. I think, you know, the uh, by using the avatar, we can have a totally different experience, right? So so I want to say that this is the uh, virtualization of the real world, right? So by, by using a different types of avatar, we can have another life, right? So that is the possibilities, right? And, uh, you know, the, so, so so far, the, we have just a single real world, right? And But on the other hand, in the virtual world, we could have a many um, uh, virtual societies, right? So that was the possibility uh, was the, the virtual, virtual reality, the virtual world. But uh, you know how the question is how we can enhance the real world. So by using the uh, avatars and by using the many types of avatars, we can virtualize the real world. We can we can have uh, in the many lives, many you know, and different experience. The uh, with avatars, I think that is uh, you know the possibility of avatars. But on the other hand, that you know the uh, virtualized virtualized real world or avatar use the cause the uh, many uh, you know the escal issues, right? So, and uh, no, the, the, we, we can exist the uh, in the real world in the you know in a different bodies, right? And 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 so and I can control the uh, many different bodies, but uh, you know the the well, the people confuse uh, the which is the uh, real myself, right? So that, anyway, so that we need to you know, think about that kind of things, right? But that that is in very interesting things. I think that's interesting, Hagita san. You know, yeah, but there's a lot of interesting discussion going on now because, I, like, you know, I, I how about that being a proxy of the experience, something we haven't thought about, like uh, all the uh, cultural divide issues, minority issues, handicap issues, and I think this is the kind of new kind of uh, value of the avatar. We haven't really focused in the initial planning. I mean, we not not that we haven't, but uh, we focus more on the functionality of the avatar rather than the experience side. Yes, to to develop the uh, uh, cybernetic but uh, the, we have to uh, the step of the uh, problems to cope with the problems. The first time is uh, uh, the limitation of the time and space. It might be the, the new kind of a cybernetic avatar will be developed at the first. The next time and uh, limitation of the brain and last time is uh, most important thing is uh, the physical, the body capability, the how to cope with these problems. 
And can I san think about the whole things that the, they covered all the things? The Ishiguro san and Minamizo san, the first time that they will develop the many kind of the cybernetic avatars. So uh, we uh, think about the step by step. It, it's a very important because we only have the five year findings right now, but still continue to the money to the one decade or three decades to reach to the five, uh, 2050. So uh, let me ask the later and David and Ed, and if you have a, uh, have a no chance to use the cybernetic avatar, what will you create the, your own uh, life? The, because, because you will be alive uh, as a centenarians, I think, I hope it. So 2022 century, so you still alive. In this case, that if you could not use the cybernetic avatars, what happens? The, you have a, another alternatives. The, please tell me. The later, how about you? Mm. I, I think I think life would be worse without <laughs> being able to experiment with cybernetic avatars. Uh, I think we would be more more limited. Mm -hmm. um, and our ability to have embodied experiences, right? Yes. And to be in other places. Yes. I think our carbon footprint would be bigger, right? We would we would fly <laughs> more, and they may, that may not be good for the earth. Um, so, what would be an alternative? I mean, right now our alternatives are to to travel, right? And while it's nice to see people face to face and do work in person, mm -hmm. I think that's only one of many ways that we could do work. And thank be with you. each other, and thank I think we I think we'd be limited. Oh, thank you very much. How, how about a David? Yeah, you know, it's 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 an interesting point, and right, and I think it it just really limits our our potential, right? Our potential for knowledge and to be be able to be in multiple places or faraway places and learn and grow and and connect uh, with, with others. It's almost you know like what what would happen today if, if suddenly. Your, your internet was pulled away from you, right? When mm -hmm. I go into the garage and go pull out my old encyclopedias mm -hmm. to, be able to go through and, and sort of take and find that gathered knowledge, right? And I think one of the, you know, one of the most important tools that we have as humans is the sense of or being able to communicate with one another and share ideas and do those things. And I think avatars will be like the internet or cell phones or whatever and sort of be that, that next mode of knowledge sharing and be able to communicate uh, it, but it also brings that sense of presence and connection. And that's something we don't have yet. So you can communicate and still connect with others. Um, and I, I think it's to take, a, to take that away would, would be, you know, uh, unfortunate for everybody, so. Okay. Yeah, how about Ed? Yeah, well, you've heard uh, already uh, uh, from Layla and David about you know, empathy. I love the example, Layla, of the, the hype simulation. Um, so I just want to say I agree with everything they're saying. Maybe maybe I'll we'll start another uh, idea as well, which is, um, you know, in in health and in in a lot of areas of invention and discovery, a lot of the big discoveries, the big inventions, are driven by serendipity, and mm -hmm. a lot of the serendipity is people meeting and exchanging ideas who don't normally communicate. So Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, who just won yeah. the Nobel Prize for CRISPR, they met at a meeting and they started talking. Costa Rica. And if you look at all of these discoveries in biology and medicine and health, a lot of them, the vast majority of them are being driven by serendipity. And so uh, one thing maybe that I can just throw out there is also I hope that maybe we can optimize our serendipity. Can we become a luckier species by connecting ideas and thoughts and people in ways that don't ordinarily encounter each other? And also, Ed, that, uh, let me ask one question to Kitam-san. Uh, I'm sorry. So no the, problem, no problem. Yes, uh, one question. So if you can use the bacteria-sized CPU, the, are you going to use the, all the things? Because the, we have the 40 million cells in body, and you just focus on the nerve cells. But the, right. in the near future, so the 40 trillion cells, uh, the each cells put into the several uh, very small uh, CPUs. And are you going to control the, all the bodies? 
<laughs> it's a very problem in terms of the LC issues, but the, uh, are you going to do the try to do the research on the these areas? Yeah, well, I, I did want to over focus on the brain, uh, although it's, mm -hmm. it's what I spend most of my time on. But of course, the microbiome, right? Bacteria in our gut, in our mouth, on our skin, mm -hmm. they communicate with our body and our brain. It's all a network. And then although this is where I think neuroscience typically begins to end, we are all connected with each other as well, right? You know, if one person has one part of a thought and a second person feels something and a third person, you know, are we all working together as some kind of meta computer, so to speak, uh -huh. uh, which kind of pushes the metaphor a little bit. But, um, but I think we have to really start building models of us as dynamical systems, both within ourselves and between ourselves. And that probably means, you know, riffing on the idea of serendipity a bit, uh, connecting fields that, rarely talk to each other, like microbes and, you know, viruses and, and all these things that work together in our bodies that remain invisible and that many of us in, in science don't pay attention to all the time, especially in brain science. But because uh, I did not uh, try to, to do the research for the nano-cybernetic avatars right now. <laughs> so the, in the near future, uh, some people might be tried to do the, this research, I think. Uh, we, yeah, actually. Uh, well, a former postdoc from my group, Dablina Sarkar, she's a new professor at MIT. Uh, yeah. and is now running her own group, and she's trying to build nano cybernetic interfaces. Great, great. So yeah. I think we're starting to see people move forward with that as their core mission. Yes, but the please discussing with the Kanai Science Group and to uh, for the, these nano cyber avatar, cybernetic avatars in the. Um, that means the Kanai san would like to talk or to discuss with the, uh, the MIT peoples about the, these problems, I think, these research issues, I think. Thank you That'd very much. That'd be great, much. yeah. yeah. Another Kanai -san, thank you very you much for your time. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the great discussion. Yeah. But I think those are very important points that we haven't touched in the uh, panel so far. Now, we have like only seven minutes, so like one minute for each uh, panelist. We have like uh, five. Uh, well, six of them right now. And uh, uh, one minute I would like to hear is the, uh, please give us, uh, please give me like a, a single most uh, uh, expected uh, use of the avatar. You know, you know, if you know, if you build this kind of avatar, you're gonna buy it. <laughs> you know, what is it? You know, but just you so, know, a very simple question. But this is a kind of marketing research, I would say. Like, uh, you know, you know, just one thing, well, probably a couple of them, and then you know, what you want to pick, you know, which I think you want to really wants to have and uh, want to use it for the daily life. But let me but start from like our PIs actually, and then uh, give time for like a three guests to think about it. But start from the Ishiguro san, I guess. Wow. So I, I so do I need to choose just one, right? <laughs> yes, one. Pick one. You have too okay. many. <laughs> well, I so you know the in my talk, you know, I have uh, well um, talked about the uh, four, for example, and the, you know the working situations and the education situations, the medical. So may, maybe I'm gonna choose the yeah, medical. So medical. home doctor. For the home uh, doctor app, yeah. So you. you know, in the under in the well, in our current situation, what we need is a home doctor. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay, thank you. Okay, the can I send then? Yeah, yeah, something that takes care of all my um, boring work that I have to do every day, <laughs> like, like attending uh, government uh, meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, things like uh, like replying to emails or. Uh, yeah, there. Like, um, I, I feel I'm spending like so much time on things that are not like really essential for the creative uh, aspect of my work. So, so I want to, yeah, I, I want some sort of, um, I don't know, like automator. <laughs> that, okay. uh, that's that's uh, like uh, boring things. Yeah, that that, that I, I wanted to as well. <laughs> okay, now Minami san yeah, what I'm interested in that is that the cybernetic avatar that can experience something that I have never done in my life. So the I'd like to expand the human kind of the umwelt, umwelt mm. the kind of the, the perception of the kind of the world mm. by cybernetic avatars. That's the my kind of the goal for the next few decades. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. 
Yeah, well, I think in the 21st century, we're tackling a lot of really, really difficult problems. If you look at health or bias and discrimination or economics or things that, that we wrestle with, these seems like extremely complicated problems. And so I think ways to help people work together in order to fuse together different ideas, disciplines, and perspectives uh, to tackle these seemingly impossible problems. I think I would love to see that take place and would love to participate in it. Yeah. Thank you. Lay it up. I think uh, similar to uh, this idea of, you know, doing things we can never do. I'd like to go places that I maybe should never go. Uh, so the deep sea, deep space, dangerous places like into, you know, erupting volcanoes. Uh, it's okay to put robots there, but it's not okay to put me there. <laughs> but I would love to experience it. And I think that'd be exciting. Yeah, that'd be exciting. And recently I saw like this, uh, I run the... Iceland volcano uh, by drones. <laughs> you know, that's exactly. isn't that amazing to actually yes. fly over the you know <laughs> up the volcano by the you know low low altitude drone. I mean, it's uh, astonishing. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. that's uh, that's happening. Uh, will be a very good one. Okay, the final thought, David. Yeah, uh, Leila, I'm really there with you. I wanted to use that as well. You know, the idea of perhaps going to space, but. Um, you know, for me in my own personal life, a lot of this is going to help me bypass the travel that I have to do at XPRIZE. I'm constantly on the road and having to travel to, to, to faraway locations to find and recruit teams to compete in these competitions. And, and I look forward to a day where, you know, maybe I don't have to fly all the way over to India for a one day meeting to try to bring teams into the competition. Instead, I could use an avatar there that's on the ground to have a, a connection with somebody there and be able to uh, really, you know, uh, be able to get them to buy into what, to get them to buy into the competition and, and participate in these. And I think by doing so, we'll find ourselves with a whole, a whole new world of, of, of competitors, not just for this challenge, but others as well. And again, I, we think great ideas can come from anywhere and avatars will enable me to find and have those conversations. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all. I mean, uh, you know, we were coming to the end of the panel, but I think we had a really interesting discussion tonight. What you know today, and then uh, raising uh, quite an interesting point, like uh, you know, focusing more on the emotional empathy aspect, and then uh, BMI futures, and then also like experiencing the you know something you never experienced, and you only understand how other feel, you know only when you experience that position and then also like we go into the uh you know dangerous uh place like uh, you know place you've never been i mean i you know right now we sort of rocked down in the COVID. we can't really go for like ancient travel i mean uh, we uh, mostly stay at home and then this is a rather unusual situation but then uh, we understand like uh you know why you know that you know or the uh you know the enjoyment of the uh, being able to meet facing face to face to people and then also like able to travel freely that we you know now realize how precious that kind of experience uh, was i mean uh, because we uh you know all the that have to be you know we have to give up for time being of course like uh, we'll resume but like uh, we recognize the value and of course like uh you know international travel every two weeks as i did before was too much and then uh, which will be uh changed uh to the uh uh, one international travel and one avatar travel or something like that. I think that would be more uh, reasonable lifestyle, I would say. But the, still, I think like uh, with that, like a cybernetic avatar in the future, you know, someday, like we imagine like uh, you know, 20 years from now, cybernetic avatar is a daily thing. And all of a sudden there's system failure, cybernetic avatar is gone. You know, they, they don't feel like uh, how we feel today and they won't be able to go anywhere. <laughs> you know, because the international travel, you know, it is not possible. And then if you, when I feel like a cyber avatar is down for like a, some uh, system trouble, we might feel like, a, oh, we lost something. And then, uh, you know, that's not the, uh, you know, regular life. So if we feel, you know, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, if anything happens, we hope we don't, but if we have like a cyber like, that people start feeling like we lost an uh, important part of their, our daily life. And then uh, cyber like, after it will be a big success. I mean, uh, whenever that is the functional, professional or emotional, uh, because that became like a really serious part of the our social and personal life. And I th hope like we can achieve that. We can achieve that for good and we can contribute to the other society 
uh, like uh, understanding each other or a carbon footprint reduction or uh, you know experiencing new things and uh, discover a uh, new wonder of the nature uh, through the use of the cyber avatar in the future well thank you very much everyone for uh, you know tonight and then uh, today and i think it was a wonderful discussion and we'll keep in touch and we'll keep discussions uh, at the part of the uh, cyber avatar a big family of the cyber avatar globally well thank you very much and then i'd like to uh, turn this back to the uh, uh, moderator, and then uh, uh, I think like uh, you know, a massive ceremony is waiting uh, uh, for that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm I'm out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great talking. Thank you. thank you very much, Dr. Kitano, and all the panelists for your very lively discussion. Uh, the time has now come to close session three and move to the closing remarks by video message of Dr. Hamaguchi Michinari. President of GST. Mina san, konnichiwa. JST Rijou no Hamaguchi desu. Honjitsuwa JST no Symposium ni go sankai itadakimashite, makoto ni arigatou gozaimasu. Moonshot gata kenkyu kaihatsu seido wa gozonji no tori, yashin teki na moonshot mokyou no moto de kenkyu kaihatsu o sumeru seido desu. 現在国によって7つの目標が設定されておりますが、そのうち4つの目標をJST が担当しております。昨年2月新型コロナウイルスの問題が深刻になり始めた頃に提案募集を開始し、プログラムディレクター、PDとアドバイザーの皆様のご
一見不可能に思えることを挑戦するには情熱なしにはできませんさらにその困難の向こうに大臣の申し上げておられたウェルビーイングがあることを心に深く留め情熱を維持していただきたい第二にこれから直面するであろうさまざまな困難山や谷を越えていくためには強い意志が必要であります熱い情熱と強い意志これを持続的に維持していくために第三に必要なことは連携であります同じムーンショットの目標を掲げた皆さん方が今日のように、えー、一堂に集まれるシンポジウムを開き意見交換していく中で連携が生まれますその中で連携をすることによって困難を超えていく情熱と強い意志を持っていただけることがを期待しておりますこれから皆様が目標とされるムーンショット計画は大変壮大な厳しいしかし厳しいプロジェクトでありますぜひ強い情熱と意志を持ってゴールに到達されることを心から願います私ども JST も組織を挙げて皆さんを支援しこのムーンショット計画が成功に導かれることを期待しております本日はご参加いただきましてどうもありがとうございます、えー、来るべき2050年の世界社会を見据えて今日から一歩一歩作業を共に進めていきたいと思いますどうぞよろしくお願いいたします Thank you President Hamaguchi Now I would like to invite Professor Hagita to give his closing remarks Professor Hagita over to you Thank you for everyone especially the David Ed Leila from the West Coast in early morning. And uh, I learned, and we learned a lot of valuable, abundant information from the project manager's talk, the opinions and comment from the participant or panelist and audience to promote uh, our Moonshot Goal One r and program. We would like to reflect the, this information to our program. And the next time, we, the me and the three PMs, uh, would like to show you the important research output. And sometimes you have a chance to opportunity to experience the, this new kind of the cybernetic avatar output. In order to realize a society in which human beings become can be free from the limitations of a body, the brain, space, and time by 2050. Anyway, thank you very much. A, a Cinderella time is approaching in Japan, but still, thank you very much for joining the, this uh, session three in this our symposium. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Professor Hakita. With these words, I would like to close this weekend symposium. When you leave Zoom, you will be redirected to our questionnaire. We look forward to receiving your comments.、Uh, please note, though, that it is the same questionnaire for all sessions. So you only need to answer it once. Finally, thank you again to all speakers, panelists, participants, and colleagues at GST. Who made this weekend symposium possible? We hope to welcome you again at our next international symposium on the 23rd of April on Moonshot Goal 6 Realization of a Fault Tolerant Universal Quantum Computer that Will Revolutionize Economy, Industry, and Security by 2050. Goodbye. <laughs>